When it comes to turning tools, there's only two types, sharp and dull. The Wood Knight is sponsored by I Would Like. Okay, so it's a little bit more complicated than that. There are a lot of different types of tools, both in shapes and material composition, but end of the day, the tool has to be sharp, otherwise turning is gonna be very slow, gonna give you poor results, and it's also gonna be pretty dangerous. So I'm gonna look at two types of tools. The first is high speed steel, and later on we'll look at carbide tools. These days, if you're buying a new turning tool, it's gonna to be one of these two types. High speed steel can be sharpened in a number of ways. Beside me, I have a six inch 150 or 150 mil dry grinder, uh, but other ways include a wet grinder, uh, such as what's available from Triton or Tormek. You can also get sanding paper driven systems. Robert Sorby has one, sort of like a belt grinder vertically, or there are ways that you can sharpen turning tools on a workshop. One of the things that you'll notice is that you will not sharpen this like your standard bench chisel. Standard bench chisels have a much softer steel which you can sharpen on a stone and that's fine. They will give you a sharper edge than what you can get here but remember that a chisel might get dull after 100 strokes and need a little bit of tune up. Whereas we're spinning the lathe at anywhere up to 3000 RPM so we need something that can take that sort of abuse, hence high speed steel. So this is what I use to sharpen. This is a six inch grinder. It's high speed with aluminum oxide wheels. They're both 120 grit. Uh, so they're nothing fancy. This is actually quite a cheap setup and it will get your tools sharp. Ideally, you'd have either an eight or a 10 inch wheel because the curvature of the wheel is reflected in the grinding. The larger the wheel, the smaller the curvature at the point of contact with the tool. So you'll get a flatter grind, which is a good thing. Ideally, as I said, you have either six or eight inch uh, and you'd have CBN wheels. Now these are much more expensive wheels, but they've got some real added benefits for sharpening. They run cooler, they run quieter, uh, and they generally will last a lifetime sort of thing, whereas these are consumable items. This is also a high speed or normal speed grinder, which is 2850 RPM, and you can get half speed grinders won't generally find them in six inch, but in eight inch. Six inch, uh, the surface speed of the wheel is slower than that of the equivalent RPM eight inch or 10, 10 inch grinder, just because of how much further the outside diameter has to move. So if you're gonna go with eight inch, go with a half speed one as it is a little bit easier to control. That being said, high speed steel is difficult to burn. Uh, you need to apply a lot of pressure to it if you're trying to burn it. Unlike say your bench chisels or planes where you can burn the steel a little bit too easily. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what medium you use to get your tools sharp. Sharp is sharp. It doesn't matter if it's on diamonds, on uh, aluminum oxide wheels or whatever. So don't get too caught up in the having the most expensive or greater sharpening gear as it won't necessarily get anything sharper than the cheap stuff. It just might be a little bit easier. For straight edge tools, having a tool rest makes it very easy to put an edge on. But for curved tools like this spindle gouge, it is a lot more difficult. It's not a straight curve. You actually have to rock back and forth to get the compound curve into it. So what is typical for turners is to have something that will hold it in a position and let you rotate. In this case, I've got the woodcut true grind jig. You put your tool in this part and you can rotate it back and forth like that, which gives you the proper arc that you need to make this cut. There are many different sharpening jigs that all do roughly the same job and you can make your own. The most popular one is probably the one-way Wolverine jig, which is mostly available in North America and not too far outside of there. Uh, this is the woodcut true grind, as I said, Vicmark have their own, uh, and there are plenty of tutorials online for building your own system, both the arm and the uh, tool holder. You might notice that these wheels are not all that clean. They're clogged up with metal from the last time I turned, uh, last time I sharpened the tools. So we actually need to dress these wheels. For that, you'll use a diamond dresser, dressing bar, whatever, uh, and you basically, with the grinder on, 
run that back and forth across the wheel and it cleans it up. I find it much easier if you hold the dressing tool in the various jigs so that you can get a more consistent grinding or cleaning. On a tool rest like this, it's easy, you can just hold it against there, whereas here it'll bounce up and down a bit if I do that. So wait for it to get up to full speed. Should probably adjust that. So I'm wanting to use the whole face if I can. That wasn't a particularly good cleaning, but it is cleaner. I'm gonna continue and make that perfectly clean. All right, the, the wheel is mostly clean, so that'll do and we'll move on. On this particular system, it has a bunch of numbers which correspond with positions for the leg. And on my particular tool, I've written five, is that's the curve that we like to sharpen it on. Each jig is gonna have something similar to this. And if you do build your own, put some indexing marks so you can get the same result every time. What we're after is a single facet all the way along our tool, rather than lots of different facets or having to regrind the whole thing every time because we're getting our angle slightly off. Set the jig to five, because that's what's on the tool. This gets inserted in like so. And before we clamp down, most jigs go for two inches or five, uh, 50 millimeters uh, for the depth of the tool protruding. I've got a block of wood there that gives me that exact point every time so I don't have to measure it. That's how I it down and we can almost get to sharpening. The next step is to loosen up our jig. And we want to get the bevel matching the curve of the wheel or as close as we can. By getting side on, I can adjust until it is equal. All right, so our next step is to actually do the grinding. I've put black marker all along the bevel and I put it in my tool rest and rotate it back and forth with the grinder on until I've got a single bevel. Um, the black marker is great if you want to check that you're hitting the right spot so I can grab the other wheel with it off. You can see that it's hitting all the way along the bevel. So basically I'm just going to go until that's all off. And that's all it takes, just about 30 seconds to a minute to sharpen your tool. Now, if you're putting a new bevel on it, so you wanna change the angle as you find that's better for your turnings, or some of the other tools can take a little bit longer, but the general process is very quick. And it has to be because for a lot of turnings, you might have to sharpen your tools two or three times per project. Uh, and that'll depend on the size of the project, the type of project, and the type of wood. For example, if I was to use Jarrah, uh, and make a bowl out of it, I'd know I'd need to turn, I'd need to sharpen my tools every two to three minutes because Jarrah has a high silica count, so it really is abrasive on the steel. Some of the other systems like the uh, wet grinders will include a honing or a stropping wheel that is very narrow profile so you can get inside your gouges. You don't strictly need that. There's nothing wrong with doing that and it can get you, uh, can, can remove the burr so it can get you a little bit of a sharper edge. Uh, and if you don't have a wet grinder, the solution is to find a little slip stone and you can just sharpen that by hand because you're really just removing that last little bit of metal. You might also be thinking that 120 grit isn't all that high compared to what we get our bench chisels up to or bench planes up to, um, that could be 8,000 grit. And again, it comes back to sharp doesn't mean polished. In the flat woodworking world, you need the very sharp blades. Otherwise, you've got to put in a lot more effort to actually make the cut because you're the mechanical force behind it. With the lathe, the lathe is doing the work for us. We're just holding the tool. So I did mention that we'd be sharpening both types of tools, that is high-speed steel and carbide tools. Carbide tool looks like this if you haven't seen it. 
um, and it's normal handle, metal bar, usually stainless steel, with a cutter on it. And this is quite similar to the cutters that you'd find on uh, thickness planers or jointers um, for those that have the spiral heads. The advantage of carbide is that you don't have to sharpen it. In this case, this is a square head cutter. So I can just rotate the cutter um, and I'll get four sharpenings out of it. Now, unlike a high speed steel tool, the carbide lasts for a very long time. However, they eventually wear out and you need to buy a new insert. So carbide tools have a higher cost of entry and higher ongoing costs because you have to keep buying these inserts. Uh, and just like with um, the high speed steel tools, it, how long a life you'll get out of it depends on the type of projects, the type of wood, so on and so forth. Carbide on the MOH scale, measure of hardness scale, is pretty high. I believe it's nine, diamonds are 10. So these aluminum oxide wheels, while they're hard enough to cut away uh, the high speed steel, would do nothing with these carbide tools and you'd gouge out your stones. The way that you sharpen is that you rub something harder against the softer surface that you want sharpened and you'll get it sharp. So because the aluminum oxide wheels are too soft, we can't use them. Uh, I don't think CBN wheels are hard enough, though you probably wouldn't want to use them anyway. To sharpen carbide, you're going to need something like this, which is a diamond sharpening stone, which I use typically on my chisels and planes. The diamond stones can also be bought in credit card size format, which is a lot cheaper, and for turners is probably all that you need. All right, so to remove the cutter so that we can sharpen it, you'll take the Allen key that would have come with the uh, tool itself. There are different sizes depending on the size of the tool. We'll take the carbide off. Uh, unlike with the high speed steel tools, we are not sharpening on the bevel, but we're going to be sharpening face down. Because the uh, cutters come in a variety of sizes and shapes, you wouldn't possibly be able to do it on the bevel. The, uh, for example, there is a round cutter and there's no way you could do that. Now you get two or three sharpens out of this. You're not gonna, it's not gonna be a lifelong tool, but two or three sharpens on four edges on something that lasts quite some time isn't too bad. So I've colored in the carbide insert. Face down on the diamond, this is a 250 grit stone. And we're go just gonna go until that black disappears. I'm only applying light pressure, and we're just about there. Now typically you'd put some water on a diamond stone to help it cut a little bit quicker, but I'm afraid that, that would wipe off all my black texture. Uh, that's actually looking pretty good, so I will give it a bit of water and soap. And that's actually feeling a lot sharper already. The final tool that you'll need to sharpen very occasionally for pen turning is the barrel trim. Like the carbide tools, it can't be sharpened at the grinder, but it can be sharpened on pretty much any medium. So you could use sandpaper, uh, diamond stones, water stones, oil stones, whatever, it doesn't matter, it just needs to be flat. Typically these aren't carbide, they're just tool steel of some sort, so they're fine to sharpen on regular sharpening gear. If you wanted to, you could even use a needle file if you hold this in a vise. Most of these will have one or two uh, grub screws, so with those loosened, you should be able to pull the head off, cut a head. I'm actually going to take those out carefully and put them aside. So you can see what these surfaces look like. They're a little bit grotty and they're starting to dull. This is one surface I've already sharpened and you can see it's a lot shinier and feels a lot uh, sharper. Now we want to sharpen these faces because we can do those easily rather than these faces where we might mess up the angle. So all you're going to do is take your cutter, press down and grind back and forth. You can see that's sharpening that up very quickly. 
Now, I didn't cover all of the tools available. I didn't cover a skew or a scraper or bowl gouges. Well, all gouges pretty much sharpen the same way. Uh, look at the manual for whatever jig you end up getting or making or whatever. There will be plenty of ways to sharpen all of those with your jig. In the case of scrapers, you'd use the tool rest, uh, a flat tool rest, sorry. But the principle is pretty much the same on all tools. Um, you want a nice consistent bevel so that you don't have any surprises when you're turning. And 120 grit is fine. If you want to go higher for whatever reason, it's not gonna hurt it, but when you're spinning at 3000 RPM, that edge is gonna wear pretty quickly. So if you've got that really wire 8000 grit edge, it's gonna be down to 120 in no time. So probably the important takeaway from this is that you can spend hundreds or even a couple of thousands of dollars in turning sharpening supplies, particularly the Tormek T7 and all of its accessories. But that won't necessarily, for wood turning, get you a better result uh, in the actual finished product than a $100 grinder with $20 wheels and a relatively inexpensive jig. So the important thing is that you sharpen frequently and you get something that encourages you to sharpen because it's no good having a sharpening system if you're avoiding sharpening it when you're wood turning because at the start of every project you probably should sharpen your tools. If you've got any specific sharpening questions make sure to leave the comments down below and I will try and address them in an update to this video. Thanks for watching.